there are so few times when as a voter, as a citizen that we can't be ignored. And really the, the big, one of those few times is when we vote and we get this tool to be able to say like who sits in those offices that uh, decides the policies that govern our day-to-day -day lives or uh, spend the, uh, the large amount of tax dollars. Uh, and we, we only get one chance to do that. And we're, we were given this highly ineffective tool. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist who is passionate about social impact and building a better, more sustainable future. Every week, I invite you to care a little bit more so that together we can all be a little better. Today, we're going to learn about approval voting and how it could change the face of politics in America. As I introduce you to Aaron Hamlin, Executive Director of the Center for Election Science, a not-for-profit focused on empowering people with voting methods that strengthen democracy. He has written articles for Deadspin, Bust Magazine, and The Telegraph, as well as many more. And he's been featured in Popular Mechanics, NPR, Inside Philanthropy, and MSNBC as an expert on voting methods. Aaron, welcome to the show. Thanks, Karina. Well, I'm glad to have you here today. I would love to first just get to know what really inspired you to dive into this world of politics and really interest you in approval voting in the first place? Yeah, I think initially my first encounter with this was in grad school, because I think before uh, this encounter, like a lot of folks, I didn't recognize the voting method, like how we put information on the ballot and how that's calculated really came into play. And in grad school, I had this instance where I was around a bunch of friends. We were in this student group and we were talking about who we were going to vote for. And all my friends were talking about voting for people who I knew didn't align with their interests. They were even disaligned with the actual reform that we were uh, in the student group for. So I just found it really uh, bizarre. And I was giving them a hard time about it. And they were saying like, well, like if we vote for the people that support this cause area, then they're not going to win anyway. We're just wasting our vote. And they were going for this long-term incremental approach. And I know I was kind of put off by it. Well, not kind of, I was very put off by it. Uh, and so I left there thinking, well, I could either maybe give, them, give my friends a hard time. Maybe have them think a bit less of me uh, throughout the rest of grad school. And uh, maybe there's something else going on here. And that's really when I caught the bug and started to think about voting methods and looking at other ways that people could express information in terms of how they voted and have it calculated in a way that really appreciates each voter and what they're trying to say, unlike what we do now, which forces us in these weird situations where we vote expressly against our interests. Right. Or you're voting for the lesser of evils because you think that your candidate doesn't stand a chance of winning. And so you're voting specifically against your interests because you're concerned more with what the what ifs of what might happen if this other person was to take hold. I think we have key examples from this as um, if you look at past presidential campaigns where people say, well, I'm either going to choose not to vote because I don't like either of these candidates, or I'm going to vote for the person who I think will be do less harm, which to me doesn't sound like it's something that will engage the populace, like a large portion of people to actually vote and to also do so with confidence that they're doing so with their own beliefs at their center. So how does approval voting get us closer to that reality? Uh, so normally when we vote, we go into the voting booth and we look at the ballot and the ballots give us some ex explicit instructions. They tell you to choose just one candidate and the candidate with the most votes wins. Uh, and I think a lot of times we don't really think about this very much because it's just the way that we've already, we, we've always seen it. Uh, but it, it really is kind of bizarre. Uh, 
because like that's the least amount of information that you can provide for one um you surely like when you look at that ballot you have opinions about multiple of those candidates uh, but you don't get to say anything uh, about that um and often choosing just one candidate can really disincentivize you from learning about these other candidates because again like if you're going back to the uh thought process of like well i don't want to throw my vote away it's like well like why even waste your your uh thinking time going through and looking at these other candidates anyway uh and so what approval voting does is it gives you flexibility in a way that you've never had before as a voter mm -hmm. so when you're looking uh, at an approval voting ballot it just tells you to pick as many candidates as you approve of. You're not ranking or anything complicated. You're just selecting as many candidates as you want. And the candidate with the most votes wins. This means when you're looking at a candidate and say you really like a particular candidate, but say they're new or they're an independent or a third party um, or even someone that's uh, bringing in new ideas within the party that you align with. Well, under approval voting, you can support that candidate and not have to worry about anything. Uh, and if you wanted to go ahead and say like, okay, well, I don't know that they're gonna win, you can mitigate against that and you can support another candidate or more than uh, another candidate uh, if you wish uh, to say, okay, well, this is another candidate that I find acceptable. Like I would be comfortable if they if they won, uh, but I also want this other candidate to win, even though maybe I don't know that they have a great shot. Hmm. Uh, and if there are also like just uh, a bunch of candidates that you like, um, and you have maybe a hard time telling between them, you can support all of them uh, in a way where previously you would have split your vote. Now you can say like, okay, these are a bunch of candidates who I can really get on board with. I'm going to uh, support all of them and not worry about vote splitting. So how would this change things like lobbying as a, for example, or would it in your opinion? Um, I see the voting method as really one facet of election reform. Um, it's probably, I mean, in my opinion, probably one of the most core components. Um, in terms of of lobbying, I mean, I mean, uh, legislators have their own uh, challenges. Like, you imagine if you have a, a an elected position and you're expected to be like an expert on everything. Um, well, like sometimes you have to get uh, they, there are different interests, whether they be uh, public advocacy groups or, or otherwise that are um communicating uh to try to like push their, their interests overall so I, I don't know that the lobbyist component would be uh as impacted um although one thing to, to keep in mind is that um uh like there may be some inter interaction with uh, looking at campaign finance uh as a component so for example yeah absolutely if, a lot of times, like under our, our choose one method, we use some proxies like for for viability. Because if a candidate doesn't isn't perceived as viable, well, we don't want to throw our vote vote away under a choose one election. So, we but they also might at... not get funding. People might not give them money. And if they ran and were able to show that they had a support base, mm -hmm. then they could stand a better chance of getting more support the next time it was time to run for office. Correct. That's right. Yeah, and and so like. Like normally when we think about like viability issues, we think about like, okay, well, how popular is this candidate? Like how, what, like what's their name recognition? What's their war chest look like in terms of like funding that they have? But under approval voting, you really don't have to worry about that uh, because you don't have to consider the viability question. All you have to look at is, do I like this candidate? Do I like their policies? Do I think they would do a good job in office? If you check yes on all those boxes, you can support that candidate. You don't have to worry about any of that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, is there a really good example from uh, any municipality within the United States where approval voting, excuse me, approval voting has already taken hold? Yeah. So uh, in uh, 2018, we were able to implement approval voting uh, with a local group in Fargo, North Dakota for the first time. Previous to that, like it hadn't been used before. We, we've really been pushing this and pioneering this effort with local groups. Uh, so we since uh, implemented it in Fargo, North Dakota uh, in 2018. After that, uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and we currently have a campaign in Seattle, Washington uh, for uh, for this year. We expect it to be on the, the November ballot of 2022. 
Hmm. Um, but yeah, like so far, we've seen some interesting campaigns play out so far with the use of approval voting. Um, and that's separate from it passing over the ballot initiative. So to me, this reminds me a little bit of what we see when we're voting in primaries, as a for example, because though you might only select one candidate, you're at least able to vote from an entire field. I wonder if there is also some element of this or some element of approval voting actually went into play during the California vote to recall Gavin Newsom. Um, and would you consider that approval voting? Um, I mean, I can describe it too for mm -hmm. people just so we get the quick one-two punch. What happened is that we received ballots in the mail that we were supposed to first vote yes or no if Gavin Newsom should keep his job. And then if yes, then nothing would happen. Nothing would really happen to his role. If a, a majority of people said 50% or more said, okay, he's going to keep his job. But if 50% or more said, no, he shouldn't keep his job, then this next page came into effect where you had a field of about 30 different candidates to choose from. And I think you could choose as many as you wanted, if I recall correctly. It might have been three or five. I honestly don't remember. But you could choose multiple candidates. So would that in your mind be approval voting, at least on that back page, so to speak? Um, I can't remember that. Uh, my recollection... My recollection in, in that one is that you couldn't choose more than one for the for the second part, hmm. uh, even though there were there were many candidates, and uh, that's pretty common. Like, unfortunately, like you, I mean, you would think like, okay, well, we've got like thirty or fifty. Like, the odd like when you when you increase the number of candidates, the odds go up that you like more than one of those candidates, mm -hmm. um, just as like a a, a logical matter. Uh, but the the, the issue there, I think, comes up a lot when you have multiple candidates in an election. I think that's a great example. Um, also, looking at local mayoral elections, like there are many cases where you could have like eight, 10 candidates. Um, this is not uncommon. Uh, and so when you look at those and when you're looking at a primary or a general election, um, it, it really is ridiculous that we're being forced to choose just one because of course we can like like more than one candidate there's it, it's it's almost nonsensical to uh, expect us to like only one in that case and when we like more than one or there are a bunch of candidates that uh, share some kind of similarity we should be able to support multiple of them uh, so that we don't have our vote split because otherwise what happens is if there is uh, some other candidate that has some amount of, re uh, of support but uh, they don't have a bunch of candidates that look like them then what happens is they don't split their vote and the other candidate block, even though that other candidate block may have uh, a, like share a lot of popular opinion among the electorate and maybe the most popular ideology overall, but for the mere fact that they had more candidates running, um, that ideology could wind up losing, even though it represents the electorate much better. Um, and so being able to avoid some of this vote splitting that occurs is a real issue that we need to address because when that does happen, you can, you can also have uh, issues for the extremism too, because our current choose one method, uh, particularly when you're dealing with primaries, you can have a lot of the vote splitting occur around the, around the center. Uh, mm. And so it can allow more extreme candidates to come in. Um, mm. That's something else that approval voting guards against is these more extreme candidates, particularly when you're talking about crowded primaries and, mm. Like the the way that we look at it is not so much that we should reduce the number of candidates. Like you, you want a you want a healthy field of candidates with with new ideas um, and exciting approaches to the problems that we face uh, within our our cities and states and, and our country. Uh, the the issue is is making sure that voters themselves can express themselves in a way where, in the aggregate, we get a clear picture of what we want and making sure that that's expressed and we can select someone who ultimately is able to make good decisions that are representative of the population itself. So how exactly does approval voting guard against extremism? To me, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent clear on that. I'd just love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So this is a, a little bit more kind of like uh, technical in terms of like how it works out. Uh, so I'll, I'll maybe, share the technical part, and then I'll maybe give you an, an example of, 
a very weird uh, election. There are actually two kind of weird elections. Um, so uh, we can think about um, uh, political ideology falling across kind of a normal distribution where we have like uh, the cluster of people really falling in the center and then it kind of like uh, going down uh, for the extremes on either like the left or the right if we want to simplify this. Um, and if there's a candidate in, in the middle um, and you can only choose one candidate, uh, well, all the candidates, all the uh, um, uh, uh, folks that also supported the um, candidate on the left or candidate on the right, they can only choose one of those. And so as a result, that candidate in the middle has their votes split with the candidate to the left of them and the candidate to the right. Um, and so they get fewer of those, uh, of those uh, selections, whereas candidates on the more of the extreme they don't have vote splitting from either end like the candidate in the center does. Hmm. They only have vote splitting uh, more towards the center. Uh, so they only have that vote splitting on one side. So they're able to pick up more votes because they get the, the the rest of the kind of the tail end of the uh, of the voting population. And we can see that uh, play out in interesting ways. Uh, so, for example, like I think like sometimes people look at issues like this and they think like, oh, like you just do a runoff like that. Mm -hmm. That solves all of this. Like you don't have to worry about any of this. If you do a runoff. Well, it's the second time of voting. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and they, they could say like, okay, well we can do a runoff. And other folks would say, we'll, we'll look at that and say like, okay, well, it seems a little resource intensive, like maybe a little bit wasteful. Like maybe we can simulate a runoff with a ranking ballot. Um, so, so there are different uh, kind of approaches to this, but both of them have their own issues. Um, so, for example, one one famous election uh, that had an open primary and then the uh, top two went on to the general election was a 1991 gubernatorial election in Louisiana. This was a, a crazy election. Uh, so there was an incumbent governor, uh, Buddy Romer. He's uh, kind of a, of a moderate. Um, and then uh, there were two other candidates who were really weird. Um, uh, one was really uh, David David Duke, who is a, a grand wizard grand wizard for the Ku Klux Klan, uh, oh very uh, outwardly racist. Um, and then the the other uh, um, uh, person was uh, uh, a Democrat, but he was pretty like clearly like caught up in a lot of like corruption uh, issues uh, and. And so what happened here was um, the Buddy Romer did not make it to the runoff. So he was a bit more in the center and the vote split between him and the person and the Democrat and then him and the, and the Klansman. Um, and what's, what's interesting here is we would think like, okay, well maybe Buddy Romer wasn't all that popular, uh, <laughs> but we know that he actually was in this election, um, but it was only because of the vote splitting. And we know that because, of the of the polling, hmm. uh, so uh, between Romer and the Democrat, um, Romer won. If you did, if you looked at them head to head, and then if you looked at Romer versus the Klansman, um, Romer also won there head to head. So this is merely a product of vote splitting that we're seeing in a way that's not really super obvious hmm. uh, either. We only know this because of, of the polling that happened, in addition to the election itself. Because you look at the election itself, it's kind of, kind of hidden because you're just looking, you don't have the, the information to be able to see what happened. And so as, as a consequence, um, you had uh, this uh, uh, these two really terrible candidates, the this corrupt Democrat, his name was uh, Edwin Edwards. Um, and, Did uh, they both have to have like <laughs> Edwin uh, Edwards and Dave Duke? I mean... Uh -huh. It's like they both had double letters. For yeah, the yeah, it's, cr it's crazy, crazy in, in multiple yeah. ways. And the the election, they had uh, folks would ride around with bumper stickers that would say, uh, "Vote for the lizard, uh, Edwin Edwards," because he's a terrible person, uh, and then and and not the wizard. Uh, so you'd have like these weird bumper stickers. People like, I, I mean, talk about like voting for the lesser of two evils here. Uh, and so what wound up happening was Edward, uh, Edwin Edwards wound up winning the election and he wound up going to prison afterwards 
for felonies that he committed while in office after winning that election. Uh, so it was a, a real horror show uh, overall. And like this is what we invite ourselves into when we do this choose one voting method, even when we add a runoff into it. Um, and what's what's weird about this is like, so that's with the traditional runoff. I think what a lot of people would say like, okay, well, you got this issue, throw a runoff in there, you get a good winner. It's like, not, not really. Um, mm. And other folks would look at this and say like, okay, well, well, we don't, it seems kind of wasteful to do that whole runoff process. Maybe we'll simulate a runoff by giving people ranked ballots to start with. And then uh, we can use that, those ranked ballots to infer uh, what the runoff would be uh, by knocking people out uh, who have the fewest first choice votes and then transferring their next choice preference over to the next candidate. Um, that method is called ranked choice voting, and that's used in uh, a number of, of cities and, and a couple of states. One uh, interesting election with ranked choice voting uh, was in 2009 in Burlington, Vermont. So that uh, that's the city that elected uh, Bernie Sanders for their uh, for their mayor before, a super liberal place, um, and uh, they had imp implemented uh, um, ranked choice voting. Um, then I think they were still calling it insert runoff voting. It's it's the same thing, uh, and so. What they what folks were told was was that okay well we're going to give you this ballot and you're going to rank your candidates and when you do this like they they were told like don't worry about ranking your favorite first it's fine you can do that and like even in Burlington Vermont like there are conservatives in Burlington Vermont uh, they have a Republican candidate uh, that that runs and this election was no different they had um, a progressive candidate who like actually does a, a reasonable job because it's Burlington Vermont. Um, and a Democrat candidate and a Republican candidate. And the conservatives were told like, hey, you can rank your favorite as first, even though you live in Burlington, Vermont, things will be okay. And so they did. So a lot of the conservatives, they ranked the Republican as first. And what happened there was, again, this kind of like weird vote splitting uh, from the middle. And so the Democrat candidate actually got the fewest first choice votes in that election. Hmm. And the uh, those candidates, like the, the Democrat candidate, the, the folks who ranked that candidate first, their next choice preference was for the progressive candidate because the Democrat candidate was getting eliminated. And so the progressive candidate wound up winning. Um, but interestingly, uh, if we do that same thing as we did in the uh, 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 lizard versus wizard election in Louisiana. <laughs> and we said like, okay, well, what about like if uh, some of these folks went head to head, like what would happen? Well, in, in, in this election, the Democrat candidate would have beaten the progressive candidate head to head and the Democrat candidate would have beaten the Republican head to head. So the Democrat was actually the best candidate despite having the fewest first choice votes. Hmm. Uh, and, and so like the progressive candidate won in that election. But the other thing that's interesting here is that the um, the Republican candidate uh, and the conservatives that voted for that Republican candidate, interestingly, had those conservatives instead uh, dishonestly ranked their favorite as a Democrat candidate, they would have gotten the Democrat candidate to win. Um, because uh, after all, like the, uh, like once the Democrat candidate gets eliminated and goes over to the uh, progressive candidate, like all those folks who voted for the Republican, they didn't get anything. Like the, that's, all that information is being ignored. So had those conservatives actually uh, ranked the Democrat candidates first, the Democrat would have won, which, I mean, they, they're not going to party over like the Democrat candidate winning like the, the conservatives in, in the city, but that certainly would have been a better outcome for them. Than um, for the progressive getting... to win. Yeah, That's I right. see what you're saying. Yeah. And yeah. so, I mean, in the case like this, you might say the progressive candidate was quite pleased with the outcome. And oh, therefore, yeah. you know, they they would support this ranked choice voting, at least in that jurisdiction, because it worked in their favor. But what you're also saying is that it could play exactly the opposite way. And we could end up with an extremist on the other side of the equation when that's not really what the voter populace wants. And so it sounds like what you're advocating for is just for the will of the people to be heard and for our voting rights to represent what our choices would be as a populace, as opposed to something that 
gives ultimately special treatment to one group or the other based on what the arrangement in that particular city or uh, municipality is. Yeah, that that's exactly right. And and when we're when we're thinking about the the people who we are electing uh, for office, we don't want these wild swings. I mean, we want policies, we want good policies to be implemented and we want them to last. We don't want them just merely overturned uh, by the next administration who has a polar opposite ideology. Well, it's very um, costly. It's costly to the people because right. every time you change something, there are costs associated with that change. <laughs> Absolutely. And and it's just so weird. Like they, there are so few times when as a voter um, that we can't, as a citizen, that we can't be ignored. And really the, the big one of those few times is when we vote. And we get this tool to be able to say, like, who sits in those offices that uh, decides the policies that govern our day to day lives or uh, spend the, uh, the large amount of tax dollars. Uh, and we, we only get one chance to do that. And we're, we are given this highly ineffective tool. Mm -hmm. So really, when we're looking at this problem, we say, OK, well, we want to arm you with a better tool that actually gets you the outcomes that your your community deserves um and so that that's the way that we look at this problem is arming voters with the tool that gives them a way to have the uh their their government align with their interests and you not said, these wild swings yeah you said something specifically about wild swings which i have agreed with for a long long time i had um in high school a political science professor mr booth who had a very different political ideology from my own. He was very conservative and I was very much not, right? And he said one thing that has, I think, been proven true time and again. He said, you know, it's a difficult situation in America when we can't keep a president in office for more than one term. When we have the kind of volatility where we're running from one party to the next, to the next, to the next, the people who pay are the American people. And regardless of the fact that we would probably vote differently from one another on every single election, I think, in fact, there's very little we agreed on in that realm. But I, I, I've still never forgot those words because I think when we have a situation where we have wild swings and continual wild swings, where we've got whiplash from one administration to the next. We also have a situation in which our politicians are less likely to collaborate. And we've seen that play out over the course of the last several administrations where they're becoming more diametrically opposed and less willing to collaborate on anything aside from, well, it looks like COVID. I mean, that's the one thing that they could seem to agree on and actually get some immediate relief or as immediate as possible relief for the American people. Um, still, there are many that don't agree with a lot of those changes. And, you know, as a, for instance, for me, I was not given a choice as to whether I would receive a child tax credit multiple times over the course of the last year. And so I smartly just put that money in a savings account because I knew I was going to have to pay the government back, right? I was going to have to pay them back when tax time came. Still didn't affect the fact that it hurt more this year to file for my taxes than prior years because money that I would have had kind of sitting aside in the government's hands was given back to me and now I had to account for that. And I imagine many people in our current life are experiencing the same thing like, oh gosh, now I have to pay this back when so it wasn't really relief from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I wonder what your thoughts are about the decisions that are being passed through the present administration as they might reflect the walkbacks from prior administration? Like, is there something that you think we should all be more aware of than we perhaps are? I mean, this kind of whiplash that you describe is like all too common. There, there's one comic strip I, I remember seeing where uh, 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 there's this political cartoon where they had this car that was stuck in this like alley and uh, there was like uh, a Democrat uh, uh, Democrats like kind of like uh, plastered on one side of the wall and then Republicans on the other. And like 
they were crashing into the uh, towards with the front of their car, and they said, "Oh, this isn't working." It's like, it's like, okay, back it up again, and they were just like go, and you would see like both parts of this car just being wrecked on either side from just going back and forth with no real progress at, at all. Uh, it, it just goes back to the idea of like there's just no sustainability, uh, no sustainability um, with this uh, um, with this kind of approach. All right. Well, it's a lot of waste. I mean, it's every time I, I it's most visible when we look at the president, what happens with the presidential office, because every time there's a change, you're talking an entire staff transition. There's very few people that rest from one administration to the next. And even anybody in the world of business will understand it's costly to hire. It's costly to train. Each of these things takes a lot of effort you know, you have to get apprised of where everything is politically, what are the goals that we're working to push through, what are the sorts of things that we're hoping to prevent. And and ultimately, it's like a complete changing of the guard. And when it's happening every four years, the cost to the public is actually quite high. So, I mean, I, I've often felt like there isn't even a situation where we really have a lesser of evils when it comes to our national voting because we essentially are given two candidates. And if we were lucky, the one we liked made it there. But most people are not at that level of satisfaction. You're ultimately sitting in a spot where the candidate that you would have liked to see in the White House or um, pushing policy forward that could affect more people in a positive way didn't get that shot. They were left on the chopping floor, you know, months before, after a straw poll and a... <laughs> Ohio, right? So yeah, there's there's one interesting component. So one of the uh, we also do a lot of uh, like research within our organization. So we did polling looking at the 2016 election, and we also did polling looking at um, the uh, the 2020 Democratic primary. And the the way that we do this is a bit different. So we're interested in voting methods. So there are all kinds of different voting methods. Like so far in our conversation, we talked about our choose one method, also called plurality voting or first past the post. We've talked about ranked choice voting, also called instant runoff voting, and we've talked about approval voting. There are some other ones out there as well. Um, so when we do uh, this research uh, that involves polling, what we'll do is we'll ask each respondent how they would vote under e each of these different voting methods for a particular election. And then we do something a bit unique um, that is uh, uh, not, uh, th th I think it was a, a bit novel, like for for this research. And so what we did was we asked people um, a control measure question. We would say, "Okay, now we want you to be honest here. Just tell us how much you would like this particular candidate uh, to hold this seat on a scale of zero to five. Uh, so we did that in addition to how would you vote under each of these different voting methods. And when we did that for the Democratic primary, what we saw was that. Uh, both uh, uh, Sanders and Warren did significantly better uh, than they did under our choose one method during that whole uh, during that whole primary. Mm -hmm. um, and even some of the other folks, like like there are a lot of folks out there, for instance, who liked Yang a lot. Um, he didn't uh, even with approval voting. Uh, he uh, got thirty percent versus ten percent. Of course, thirty percent didn't put him in the front of the pack, even with approval voting, but a significantly uh, different amount. Uh, in a way that um, he possibly wouldn't have been marginalized to the same extent that he was. Um, but looking over at uh, Warren and Sanders, I think a lot of folks will look at them and say like, hey, like, I don't know. I think they may be too liberal for the party. It may not really represent the party's uh, values in terms of people who are registered as Democrat. Uh, but I think what approval, one of the things approval does is it kind of gets past what we perceive as being politically acceptable because you look at some of the just for them for instance like s some of the policies that they uh, that they ran on and some of these policies when you pull on them in their own right they do pretty well like looking at different aspects of like healthcare reform for instance different types of tax policies uh, and even though like some folks in the democratic party may look at this and say like okay well i think those are too extreme well we don't have to always listen to what like the media or the party itself tells us uh, as far as like what's acceptable. When you have a voting method that just 
goes through that, um, you can get that information uh, directly um, in a way where previously those candidates would have been marginalized or you would have been told like, hey, the reason they lost was because their ideas were too extreme rather than like maybe there was just a lot of boot splitting going on. And, and going back to that control measure, one of the ways that we empirically know that approval voting does a good job capturing the support is to the degree that it overlaps with this control measure. Uh, and you can also like any uh, the listeners can go to electionscience.org uh, and look up the democratic primary on our site. And you can see how well this control measure uh, mimics um, the approval voting uh, votes as well. So like you see these align up uh, really well Whereas when you look at it with, uh, say, our choose one method, or even uh, the ranking method for that matter, um, there's a lot more in terms of discrepancy. Uh, so I, I think it just goes back to the idea of when we dismiss certain candidates or ideas out of hand, I think we need to reflect on that and think, like, is it that these ideas are really that far out there? Or is it just that we have a really terrible voting method that doesn't pick up on it and we do use a different one that does? So what do you think our chances are of actually getting to a spot where our national presidential campaigns and, and voting are actually done and using approval voting as opposed to other methods? Uh, so when, uh, when kind of like getting into this space, like it was uh, uh, clearly a, a, big, uh, a big hurdle like overall, because when, when we were looking at this, um, before we got our initial funding at the very tail end of in December of 2017, um, approval voting was something that was looked a lot in academia. It had been used for government. Uh, it, it had been used for government offices. It had been used in like different organizations, often like math and statistics organizations, uh, even though it's a simple voting method. And we had to look at this and say, okay, well, uh, we have to be able to show proof of concept. We have to replicate and we have to be able to scale. And so we've started with uh, with cities, um, starting with Fargo of about 120,000 people, then St. Louis of 300,000, um, and now looking at Seattle with three quarters of a million, it's the 18th largest city in the country. And next we're transitioning into states. We haven't announced an, uh, a state campaign uh, yet, but that's where we're, we're, we're moving. The nice thing about states is that when you pass a ballot initiative in the state, which is what we do, like we don't ask the uh, people who are elected themselves to pass this through legislation because they have a conflict of interest. We just ask the voters. Um, and it's been popular. It's a very simple method, doesn't require anything um, complicated uh, in terms of infrastructure. And I think that's what helped it pass in Fargo by 63% and in St. Louis by uh, 68%. Um, but as we look into states, uh, you also get to uh, control how federal seats are elected. So you're talking about U.S. Senate seats, yes. U.S. House seats, um, and also electoral votes. Um, so you can control how presidential elections are uh, administered in that state. Um, so you can have it administered by approval voting uh, within the state that is passed as well. Um, and that'll control... Um, the electoral votes for that state, because it's up to the states how they uh, assign their electoral votes. So if you pass um, uh, an initiative for that state that says, this is how we vote for presidential elections using approval voting, um, that also controls how their electoral votes are assigned. Well, I'm encouraged. I'd like to see a simpler system enacted. I personally found when I was reviewing ranked choice voting, it's sometimes difficult to choose who you would put first because you know that's more weighted it's almost like you're in the same you're you're in the same boat you started in so to speak yeah and it, it can also be uh, challenging there when you have a longer candidate list so with ranked choice voting um just like the feasibility of ranking uh more candidates um often people will admit more candidates which means that they lose information and we and we know from research for instance like there's a canadian mathematician mark kilgore identified that when uh, voters don't put as much information down on ranking ballots so they can fail to identify the correct winner. Um, and the other component is that when you have a longer candidate list, because ranked choice voting is a more complicated with its ballot design, mm -hmm. uh, that it may not be feasible to even allow voters to rank all the candidates that they wish. Uh, and again, you're getting back into that issue of 
voters not being able to provide the information that they wanted, and then that resulting in not being able to identify the correct winner. So how can our audience get involved and push for this new method of voting if they agree with our discussion thus far and if they think this sounds like a good thing? How can they get involved? Well, we have a, an awesome director of, of campaigns, Chris Rally, and what he's done is he's worked to set up a nationwide chapter system, uh, mm -hmm. which is how uh, these chapters develop into campaigns. Um, and so what you can do is you can go on our website at electionscience.org. Um, we have a, you go up to the menu at the top for take action um, and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can join our discord. And that's how we work to uh, start these chapters. Uh, we provide uh, logistics uh, support for being able to help these chapters graduate into uh, campaigns. Uh, and so, uh, we've identified all the ballot initiative states. Uh, we've also polled on all the ballot initiative states, identifying the best uh, uh, language for each state, which uh, the reason we have that information is because of our new director of uh, uh, research, uh, Whitney uh, Hua, and she's uh, figured out um, through a sophisticated polling approach, the best language in each respective state. So we have a lot going for you, like in terms of uh, like joining one of these chapters and um, moving it into a campaign. Uh, it's not something it's it's daunting to try to do on your own. And so what we're here is to help communities um, with the support that they need to be able to arm themselves with the, the, this voting method, this tool to actually get the government to respond to their interests. Well, thank you so much, Aaron, for joining me today. I've really enjoyed this conversation and I've learned a fair amount too. So I want to thank you for taking the time. Is there a question that I haven't asked that you wish I had, or perhaps a thought that you'd like to leave our audience with? Uh, I, I think a, a lot of times like we, we look at things like a broken government and it can seem just so daunting uh, sometimes. And it's, a rare instance where a solution for this scale of a problem is so straightforward as saying like, okay, maybe you can pick as many as you want instead of just one. It, it, it's uh, very rare that uh, a solution can be so simple. And this is really one to take advantage of. So I definitely encourage listeners to, uh, to jump on board, get involved. Um, it's a really exciting journey to, to take back what's ours, our democracy. Yeah. Well, I think that's perfect. Thank you, Aaron, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Karina. Now for everyone listening or watching this on YouTube or Facebook, wherever you happen to be absorbing this content, I'll be sure to include links to Aaron's website, aaronhamlin.com and electionscience.org and show notes on our website. You can visit caremorebebetter.com. There you will find a complete blog, video interview, and even a surprise or two. And there's even a five-step guide to unleash your inner activist. If you're itching to get involved and be a change that you want to see in the world, then just sign up for our newsletter and it will be your welcome gift in your inbox moments later. As you consider what we've covered today, I want for you to think about how you vote. And when you choose a lesser of evil, as you make your voting decisions, if we've had a better way of voting, how might we change how we vote? Would you engage more? Would you actually be more interested in what's happening in our political world? If we had approval voting, how might your voting habits change? So I invite you to lean into discovery, stay curious and hopeful, ask questions, consider joining one of those chapters, and let's build that better world together. Thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. We can even overhaul the way we vote. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.